Hello. How you doing? Okay. You have the uh, source sheet, yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Do you want me to let them in or you want to wait a couple minutes? No, no, we'll wait. Let's wait. Okay. I'm so nervous about Zoom bombing. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing about the drawing, I don't know. I don't think that they can actually draw on yours, but if you share the screen, screen quickly with me, I can see if I can do it. Share the screen? Yeah, just to see if I can draw on it. Okay, you're recording this part. So you might have to okay. start again. I can, well, they'll, they'll cut the recording. I just didn't want, okay. I just don't want to have that same thing where I forgot to re-record, so. Okay. Yeah, so it does look like I can still, but I guess I'm a host, so it might be that other people can't uh -huh. say it on it. All right. Well, if you go up, like, do you see up, up on the top bar where it says view options? Um, I don't know exactly what it'll look like for you. It's okay. Why don't you go back to your screen and then I can see. I'll just look it up later. Okay. Well, if, yeah. if, things, go if things go crazy, you're going to save us. That's all I yeah. care about. I'll try. <laughs> okay. Can you get some water? Yeah. Oh yeah, and if you could just, um, they asked me to ask you to plug the Yomi Yoon before the class starts. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, amazing. Yeah, yeah <laughs> good, and remind, if I forget, I'll plug it at the beginning and the end, but uh, okay. I'm just getting the link, to, I can put it in the chat box, so. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Okay, good morning, everyone. So nice to see your faces, those of you who have your camera on. Um, so we're back today to learn uh, about uh, the Magid section. Yesterday, my colleague, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, did um, the Four Sons. And um, the previous day, I did uh, the journey from Gnuth to Shevach. My argument is, if all you remember is that the, the Haggadah is a journey from degradation to praise, even though that can take many different forms, then you're in a good place. And uh, you don't have to worry about too much else besides for that story. And in the beginning of the week, we did Halach Ma'anya. What does it mean to have Lechem Oni? The, what's the bread that we answer about or that we offer many uh, responses to? in addition to the bread of affliction, the bread of poverty. And we also asked the question of, what does it mean to feed the hungry? Um, whoever is hungry, come and eat. Did we really say that ever, or especially this year? And what other interpretations could that mean? That, that recording actually exists um, online on Facebook. At least can send it if you need it. Um, we're going to send out the source sheet in just a moment for today. Elise is going to drop that in. I want to say one, one plug. Um, before we get started, which is on Sunday, we have a, um, a Yom Iyun, a mini Yom Iyun for, for Pesach. We were supposed to actually be doing this in Westchester and also in Boston, but we're combining forces and doing it all online. Um, uh, I'll be teaching as well as some of my colleagues. I'm going to put that in the chat box as well. Um, so for those of you who want a break from, from cleaning for Pesach for a couple minutes, you can log on to the Yom Iyun, which of course will be um, on Zoom. Okay, so we're going to look today at the question of Manishtana. 
what is Manishtana? Um, and what what did it used to be? What is it now? And probably most uh, significantly for me, what are the possible uh, understandings of the phrase Manishtana and how might that itself open for us other interpretations of what the Haggadah is actually trying to do? And my main approach to the Haggadah is the Haggadah is a telling and retelling of themes that could be expressed in different ways. Um, so the Gnut Teshevach is a great example because if I say to you, tell a story of degradation to praise, you could come up with, and people at your table could come up with multiple versions of how to do that. I want to argue that Manish Chana is going to be the same. That is to say, how we translate Manish Chana is not just a one uh, singular dimensional uh, way of looking at those words, but actually an opening for possible interpretations, even of the words that are getting us to ask questions and interpret. Okay, but let's start by looking at the textual history of Manish Chana because it's kind of kind of nuts and worth worth looking at. Um, I, was, I saw somebody advertising that they're doing a, a class on the numbers of the Seder, and I think most of us associate the number four as the main number of the Seder. If you think of the, the four children, of the four cups of wine, um, the four questions, of course. But uh, we're going to see that the four questions are neither four nor questions. Um, and in that way, actually, you could think of other numbers that might also be um, guiding, uh, guiding numbers for the Seder, like even the four cups. Well, actually, there's a fifth cup, kind of. Um, and the four questions, uh, we'll see that that has its own complicated history. So um, I'm going to share my, my version of the source sheet on my screen. Uh, it's in the chat box um, that Elise sent, and maybe she'll send it one more time for those who just joined. Um, okay, so let's just remind ourselves of the four questions as we have it in the Haggadah. Manishana halayla zemi kol alelod. Translated here, how different this night is from all other nights. As we'll see, the translation is something that could go multiple ways. We'll get to that towards the end. But either it's why, like ma as a question word, why, or ma as an ex exclamation, like. Matovu o alecha Yaakov. How how good are your tents, O Jacob? That's not a question. That's a statement. Marabuma secha Adonai. How you know amazing are your uh, are your creations, O Lord? Um, so the ma here could be a question word, could be a statement word. We'll come back to that. But whatever it is, this night is different from all other nights. Shebechol alilon anu achlin chametz matzah halayla zekulo matzah. All the nights we're we're eating chametz and matzah. My my father-in-law actually does eat matzah year round, so I can attest that that's actually done by some people. Um, but tonight we're only eating matzah. Now this one's a little bit strange. All of the nights we eat shear yirakod, other vegetables. Halayla hazem maror. Actually, in modern, I don't know why modern Israeli versions of this, it's kulo maror. You can see that from the meter, you might want to stick in a kulo. But we know that we don't only eat maror, uh, even though chametz and matzah, we only eat matzah. Um, but she'ar yirakot, we also eat on Pesach. So just to know, I'm putting a pin in this one, it's a little bit strange because it's like they throw a curveball right by us. Sounds good. It sounded just like the last one. You know, chametz and matzah, layla ze kulo matzah, she'ar yirakot, layla ze maror. It's true. But not exactly accurate because we eat she'ar yirakot also on, on Pesach. All of the nights we don't even dip once. Alayla pa'amim or pa'amim for the grammarians. So tonight we actually dip twice. So now I was just asking my kids at breakfast because the, the new world that we live in is, you know, uh, you know, 10 seconds before you're teaching a class, you're actually with your family. So I'm asking my kids at breakfast. So what are the two, what are the two dippings? So they said, well, the first dipping is obvious. That's karpas. You dip it in the salt water. And the second dipping, they said, was when you dip your pinky into the wine and, pour, and dip out the 10 drops of wine, which I thought was, a, uh, you know, from a, a kinesthetic standpoint, it's definitely true. Although probably in olden times, they would pour out the wine as opposed to using their finger because they were a little bit, as we all are worried about germs, sticking your finger in your glass is not really ideal. Um, but it, in truth, the other dipping was the maror in the charose. Um, so if you have two dippings, halayla zesh te pa'amim, two dippings, one of them is maror. Now, um, the bavli actually, um, uh, well, we'll see, the older version of this 
has has a other on all the nights we dip once. Tonight we dip twice. We have on all the nights we don't even dip once. Tonight we dip twice. And you can see, just like when you're reciting the Manish Chana, you know, as a sing song, you know this is the tricky one because it says Ain Anu Matbilin, but they all start Shabakola Lord Anu Ochlin, Anu Ochlin. So this one is like the odd, the odd one out, Ain Anu Matbilin. So it happened to be that in the old old versions it was, yeah, we dip once. Tonight we dip twice. So that would just raise another question, which is, well, if the main thing of this line is the second dipping, which is the maror in the haroset, then how come maror gets two of four questions, right? It has she'ar yirakot and maror, that's the second question. And if this one really is focusing also on maror, the second dipping, then maror gets two questions. And now you're gonna see how this is already, uh, it's a little bit unnatural to have two questions for maror. Um, and in that way, you could see that this, Something's been done to this text. And then the last one, all the nights we either sit or lean. This night we only lean. This is um, a question that only, or a statement that only appears after the Talmud in ancient times. The idea of leaning at a formal banquet was as normal as sitting in a chair is for us. You would never ask, why do we sit in a chair when we're sitting down to dinner? And they would never ask, why do we lean, i.e. sort of lie on a couch at a formal banquet? Um, because that was just a normal practice. So we've knocked out, I'm arguing, of our four questions, we've knocked out, or at least we've asked, we're suspicious of two of them. One of them is the leaning, which everybody was doing. That wasn't so abnormal. And one of them is Maror, because we ask it twice. There's two questions about Maror. So what are we left with? We're left with Matzah, one Maror. And, um, and that's pretty much it. We have two questions. So what's missing? Now, if I say to you, this is a good game of association. If I say to you, matzah and maror, then you know there's a third one that's waiting to be said. Rabbi Gamliel says, if you haven't said these three things, you haven't fulfilled your obligation. And the first one is Pesach. Pesach, matzah, and maror. Now, what's the Pesach? The Pesach is the sacrifice, like when you think of the Hillel sandwich, the Hillel sandwich was much, much tastier with meat. So if you're thinking about what is the organizing principle of the Seder as it comes to foods, Pesach, i.e. the meat, the sacrifice, Matzah and Maror, Rabban Gamliel's statement of what you have to say at a, at a Seder, that actually could be our organizing principle for the four questions. So let's take a look at the, the four questions as they were in the, um, in the Mishnah of old. Now, what's amazing also here is this is also the, the story of how texts that we say as liturgy actually penetrate the source text and change them. So the liturgy of the Haggadah actually penetrated the Mishnah. If you open up the Mishnah, the printed version of the Mishnah, you'll see now our four questions are printed in the Mishnah. But the old Mishnah, because that's what we say at the Haggadah, so everybody knows what the four questions are. So obviously, you're going to make sure that those are in the Mishnah that you're learning. But in the old manuscripts of the Mishnah and all versions of this, all, even through the Middle Ages, this was true, you have other questions that are not four, okay? There are three, and I'm even saying questions when they're really statements, okay? So now I'm in the second box. Mazgulo Koshini, they pour for the, or they mix for the leader the second cup. Vikan haben shoel aviv, and here the child asks the, the parent. Vim ein dad haben aviv melando, and if there is no dad, we looked at this uh, two days ago, if there's no knowledge in the child, then the, the father instructs him. By the way, some versions of this say, take out the word ein. Vim dad haben, if the child actually has some sort of knowledge, then the, ch the father instructs him. Um, and what does the father say? The following text, that is to say, manish chana, not a question said by a child, but rather, a uh, prompt said by the adult who, because the child didn't ask a question, needs to move things along and say, hey, I want you to notice some things that, that are unusual about tonight. Uh, and so this is what the, 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 the father says. That remains the same. All other nights we dip once. Tonight we dip twice. That's the straight up, I'm telling you, this is the Maror one, right? The second, it was totally normal to dip once. Dipping was part of how you start a meal. Um, it's your appetizer and you, would, and you would dip it, not in salt water, but you would dip it in uh, you know, something tasty. Um, 
you know, trina or something like that. Whatever, not trina, best, but, but you know, whatever you're going to dip it in, it's going to be something that is totally normal. Um, but, uh, but tonight we dip twice. The second dipping is the maror, okay? And, and it seems like actually the first dipping, which we have now, like in my family, it's a potato, anything you say, bori pri adama, actually, probably originally, you would dip the lettuce, the chazeret, which was the original maror, you would dip that twice. Um, and some opinions, even in Yerushalmi, say that the first time you dip, that's when you say ala chilat maror. If you forgot to say it then, then you say it later on. But, you know, maybe you say maror way at the beginning, which kind of makes sense because that's the part where we're bitter. Uh, you know, we want to feel the bitterness at the beginning of the night. Okay, so the first question is maror, which also chronologically in the Seder is the first thing you encounter, as opposed to our version where we have matzah first. The second one is the one that, the only one that stays constant, that one, we, we're all on board with that one. Tonight, we eat only matzah. So we have mara, maror, matzah. And then, any other night, we have basar, meat prepared any way that we want. Roasted, boiled, and cooked. But tonight, we only have it roasted. Okay, so there you have your Pesach. You have maror, matzah, and Pesach. Probably got a little Pesach, matzah, and maror. That's the original three questions, three statements. Um, now, why did it change? So we know that uh, for better and for worse, we don't eat the roasted lamb anymore. Again, a little sandwich would be tastier if we did, but uh, we don't eat that anymore. That actually is a relatively recent development in terms of Jewish history. That is to say, even after the temple was destroyed, many Jews would have a roasted lamb on Passover. I mean, it's like the main thing. You know, it's like the, the holiday is called Pesach. You're going to take away my roasted meat? That doesn't sound good to me. So they would have it. And the, and the sages were, you know, a little bit iffy about that because they were nervous about people recreating stuff that you would only do in the temple uh, on their own. But it seems like this was the practice for a long time. Even after the close of the Talmud in certain Eretz Israel communities, people were eating roasted meat. And of course, roasted is what the Torah says about that's how you're supposed to eat the Pesach. You're not allowed to have it any other way. Okay. So up until now, we have our three statements as opposed to our four questions. The three statements are covering Maror, Matzah, and Pesach. And when we uh, sort of redid those into four, we added the leaning one. We doubled down on the Maror, and we added, um, and we took away the meat one, which wasn't uh, relevant for people who weren't eating meat anymore, the roasted lamb anymore at their uh, at their seder. I'm just gonna. Stop here for one second and look at your look at your chats. Um, okay, yes, potatoes for people who didn't have couldn't grow greens at this time of year. Um, good, you can read the chat for other other uh, wonderful traditions that people are sharing. Thank you for that. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back to sharing and we're gonna look a little bit more and we're gonna get to the question of what does Manish Shana actually mean or what are the meanings I should say of Manish Shana. Um, so back to sharing here. Um, okay, first of all, in case you're, you're, you're worried about, wait a minute, do I have to say Manishtana? Now, you can't imagine a Seder without Manishtana, but it is also originally just a prompt in a case where the child didn't ask a question. So if, child, anybody, if anybody asks a question, technically the Manishtana is not even required. Um, uh, and, and this little story explains it. Why did they remove the table? This is something we, we don't do because we don't live, we don't eat anymore on uh, little TV dinner trays, but they would actually lift away the trays uh, in the beginning of the Seder. And the school of Rabbi Yana said, why do they do that? So that children will ask. That is to say, the whole thing is for kids to ask. And the Mani Shana is just a backup plan if you don't ask. Abai was sitting before Rabbah. We have a story. Abai was sitting before Rabbah. He saw that they were taking the table away. Rabbah was Abaye's teacher. So Abaye seems to be a kid in this story. Um, Abaye sees that they're taking away the table. He said to them, we still haven't eaten. Why are they taking the table away? He asks the question. And Rabbah says to him, patartem milomar manishtana. You've exempted us from saying manishtana. That is to say, the whole point is to ask the question. You ask the question. I don't need to prompt you with manishtana. Okay. Um, uh, and this also follows into the Middle Ages where people would only say Mani Shana if nobody asked a question. Um, all right, and just to be clear, 
you know, nowadays this is like the 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 youngest introverted child's nightmare is to say Manish Tana. But I want to also raise the possibility that it was a very, very recently that the kids would ask Manish Tana because the Manish Tana was really a prompt for the kids to ask their own questions that are not scripted. Okay, so you have in the Rambam, they mix the second cup, here the son asks, and the reader says, so little kids, this is your, your, uh, your opportunity to get back at the leader of the Seder. The leader of the Seder is supposed to ask or say, Manish Tana. That's the, that's the job of the Seder leader. It's a prompt, not a question in this view. But already pretty old, the child is asking this and it turns into questions, probably because the word ma also is a question word. And so we see in Sajigo, it actually precedes the Rambam. If there's a child who knows, he should stand on his feet. Bishal, madavar um, alayla ask the manish Um Okay, so the, the child does ask the question, but for most of Jewish history, or for a long time in Jewish history, it was the Seder leader who would use this as a prompt. Okay, this is, I'm skipping over the meat stuff. This is where we used to eat meat, but now we don't, want, we don't do that anymore. Okay, so now I'm, I'm moving to the, uh, the question of what does manishtana mean? If I say to you just the phrase manishtana, um, which again, we could translate as why, um, why is this night or how is this night different from all other nights? Or how different is this night from all other nights? Is it a question, is it, is it an exclamation? Uh, so just, um, and scholarship has done some of this, this work, which I'm drawing on, looking through rabbinic literature and seeing the places in which elsewhere rabbinic literature, the rabbis use the phrase manishtana as a way of trying to understand what it could mean. And what I think, this is uh, my approach here, is that manishtana is neither a question nor an exclamation, it is both a question and an exclamation. That is to say, it's, one, it's an amazing phrase to start with because it itself has multiple interpretations and we can see that from the context in which we use Manishtana uh, in other places. We find Manishtana in other places in rabbinic literature. Okay, so I'm gonna bring you a couple of examples of that. Uh, the first is Manishtana used as a rhetorical question. Like, what's the difference between tonight and, no, and any other night? No difference. That's the, right. I'm asking you, it's like, you think there's a difference? There's no difference. All right. And here's an example of how this was used. It's actually a fascinating text from the Mishnah in Kalim um, in the middle of a uh, discussion about which, which certain vessels can, you know, contract impurity or not. Uh, and we have this, uh, this statement. All things created on the first day of creation are susceptible to tum'ah, susceptible to uncle uncleanness. Now, what was, I mean, this is kind of crazy because what was created on the first day? Just light. Okay, but, well, we're not going to get through this Mishnah in, in its depth, but just to notice how they're going to use Manishana. All things created on the second day are not susceptible to uncleanness. All things created on the third day are susceptible. So you have a sort of ABA structure. You're running through the days of creation. The first and the third are susceptible to Tuma. The stuff on the second day is not susceptible to Tuma. All things on the fourth day and the fifth day are not susceptible to Tuma, except for what is made from the wing of the black eagle or vulture um, and the glazed shell of an ostrich. Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri interjects and says, Mani shana What is the difference between the wing of a black eagle vulture and all other wings? That is to say, everything on the fifth day uh, should be on the same category of uh, susceptible to uncleanness, not just this, the exception of this bird. But just notice he says manishtana in the, in the form of, what's the difference? There's no difference. Impl implication, there's no difference. Um, so you could imagine, this is a stretch, but I think it's just interesting to put out there. You could imagine the manishtana as a statement of, what's the big deal? There's no big deal. There's no difference. Okay. And again, as a prompt, you know, you might actually just stop with the first sentence. Manishtana laila zemikola laila. You know, you, you know, Abaye says, why are you taking away the table? And, and Rabbi says, yeah, what's the difference between tonight and all the nights? And then the kid would respond and say, but, but this and this and this, there's so many differences. In other words, you wouldn't have to go through the rest of the prompts if you look at my Shana as a rhetorical question. Ah, there's no difference between tonight and all the nights. And then everybody at the table would say, no, of course there is. So this could be a way of sort of introducing a prompt with a rhetorical question that actually is false, okay? There's no big deal between tonight and all the nights. Everybody says, but there is, there is. What about this and this and this? And that's a way of, another way of thinking about it as a prompt. 
Okay, so that's Mani Shana as a rhetorical question. I'm just gonna pause for a second and look at the um, the chat. Um, yeah, so Barry's asking, so why are the questions required? We have many discussions without questions. That's a good point. I mean, I, I think in some ways the question is a stand-in for let's begin a discussion um, as opposed to, you know, let's just get to the meal. By the way, there is some scholarship that suggests that the meal preceded the Magid section. And boy, <laughs> wouldn't that be a different experience, right? In other words, if you're going to ask the question of, wait a minute, how come, you know, we haven't even brought out the meat. So how could you ask a question about the meat unless the meat was already been consumed and you knew that it was roasted and you knew there was no boiled meat that was coming out of the kitchen, right? That, that would lead you to ask the question. So this scholarly debate um, about whether or not the, uh, the meal originally preceded the discussion part of it. Um, but you could imagine a world in which that would be totally normal. You had the meal. There were so many strange things at the meal. And if nobody asked, started the discussion at that point, you'd be like, okay, guys, let me draw your attention to something. Anyways, there was nothing different about this meal, right? And everybody says, no, of course there was. And then you begin your discussion. Okay, so that's a possibility. All right, I'm moving down the line to the next possib possible, of, uh, possible interpretation of Manishana. Manishana actually has a question. Like, I just don't know the answer, and I'm going to ask it as a question. There's a variety of these throughout rabbinic literature. I brought you, uh, I brought you one. Rabbi Hanina said, I asked Rabbi Ezra in the, in the house of Mot Baraba, what's the difference between firstborn donkeys and firstborn horses and camels? Okay, that is to say, Manish Tanu, what's the difference? Now, this is a question that the questioner, Rabbi Hanina, doesn't know the answer to. Um, okay, and he's just, I'm asking a question. Um, and then he gets an answer. Okay, we're not going to go into the answer. Um, but then he asks him some more questions in this selection from the Bavli. And I also asked him, what's the word Rifidim mean? What, in, in, in the Torah, when it says Rifidim, is there some significance to that place word Rifidim? And he said to me, no, it's just a name. That's just the name of the place. And I also asked him, what's the word Shitim mean? And he said to me, that's also just a place. It's just a name. Okay, so I'm asking questions that I don't know the answer to. And this would actually make the most sense if a child is asking the question, Manish Tana, you know, and I don't know the answer. Um, you know, but of course I do know the answer because I'm going to start to delineate all the ways in which it's different. But if you just even think of this as a sentence, how is this night different from other nights? Let's talk about it. Okay, I don't know the answer. What are you, you know, you going to come up with? I would have never come up with the second dipping being the dipping of the, your picky into the wine. So, but you start a discussion and you don't know the answer and people will say things you don't know. Okay, so that's Mani Shana as, as, a, as a, a real question where I don't, it's not a script, I actually don't know the answer. And I'm gonna say Mani Shana to open a question, to have a questioning stance in which I could see what's gonna emerge, okay? Um, so we have it as a rhetorical question, no difference, Mani Shana. And we have it as a real question, I literally don't know, tell me the difference. And then the third one is as an opportunity to expound, as an opportunity to offer a drusha. That is to say, it's a prompt that's going to explain something that you didn't totally understand uh, on first blush. Uh, actually, this is part of the brilliance that uh, Ethan mentioned yesterday about the way in which the four sons is really interpreting the Torah and reading it as a love letter. This is like the Manish Chana is an opportunity to read these things as a love letter. Okay, I'm going to take you to an example of that. Um, from Midrashic literature. So there's a, a, a war that the, um, that, that the Israelites are fighting. And after they fight the war, they win and they celebrate. And the way they celebrate, I'm going to, this is from Second Chronicles, not an often read text, the last book of the Bible. Second Chronicles says, after taking counsel with the people, Yehoshaphat stationed singers to the Lord, extolling the one majestic and holiness, as they went forth ahead of the vanguard saying, Okay, so um, they were going out to sing, to sing in battle. And as they began their shouts and hymns, the Lord set ambushes for the men of Ammon and Moab and the hill country, and they were routed. Okay, so what you have here is uh, a, a fascinating um, moment in which people are going out to war. They're fighting a holy battle. Um, and they're singing Hodu Ladonai, Ki Leolam Chasto, and indeed they win the war. Now, you know, just as well as I do, we're going to say uh, at the Seder, there's Psalm 136, 
which starts off not hodu ladonai kilo lam chasto, but there's there's two words that are missing, right? What are the two words? Hodu ladonai kito kilo olam chasto. Okay, so reading this as a love letter, you would say, wait a minute, I know that it's supposed to say hodu ladonai kito. Praise God for it. God is good. God's mercy is forever. Okay, so where's the kito? This is where the midrash goes. Um, in, in Tanhuma. And so it's written concerning Yehoshaphat. After taking counsel with the people, he stationed singers to the Lord, extolling the one we just read, and said, Praise the Lord, O Duladonai, Kilulam Chasto. Manishtana Hodaya Zo Mikola Hodayo Torah. What is the difference between this Hodaya, this Hodu, this thanks, and all the other Hodus in the Torah, where it does say that God is Kito, that in all the other ones it says Kito, but here it does not say Kito. It is as if there is no joy in heavens when the wicked die. Right? So this is a, a question which has an answer. That is to say, the Manish Tana here is an opportunity to expound. I know the answer. I'm bringing you along and having you notice something you might not have noticed. What you might not have noticed is the words Kitov is missing. And I'm telling you that's striking. And my reason for that is because Things aren't so great. Even when wicked people die, they do not rejoice up in heaven. Um, and that's the third, the third way in which you could look at Manishana. Manishana is a, uh, an opportunity to expound. I'm raising your consciousness to something that needs an explanation. You didn't know it needed an explanation until I told you it did, and I pointed out the difference. Manishana, now we better interpret it, okay? And this, of course, on the substance, uh, calls to mind um, you know, our last text here, which is... Um, the, the, the famous text of why uh, at the singing, at the, the Shirat Ayam, um, when the angels were praising, um, praising God, um, it's as if the angels, uh, the angels wanted to sing a song, but the Holy Blessed One said, the works of my hand, Ma'aseyadai Tovin Bayam, the works of my hand are drowning in the sea, Ba'atem Omrim Shirav, and you're going to sing a song? So there's this uh, sort of substantive uh, re relation to the Midrash of Manish Tana from Tanhuma, which is mentioning this idea of God doesn't celebrate when anyone dies, even the wicked. Um, so again, to, to sort of bring it together, Manish Tana as a, um, op an opening for the discussion and the opportunities that we have to say in the Seder, um, either as a rhetorical question, there's no difference, right? That would prompt something. Or a real question, what's the difference? I don't know, explain to me. Or as an opportunity to expound, what's the difference? I'm gonna tell you what the difference is. And this is the thing that I'm noticing that you should notice as well. So again, I wanna thank everybody for, for being here. Um, we'll see you with my, um, my colleague, Rabbi Aviva Richman uh, tomorrow. And I'm gonna just put back in the chat, this is the Yomi Yun that we're running on Sunday. We have opportunities to learn from me and other Adar faculty. Um, uh, in advance of Pesach, and we'll see you here tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you so much. Have a good morning, everybody. Thank you.